past is forever. But the future, even if it has been written, can be changed. So focus on the future, not the past. Hey everyone, Damiani here. I'm joined by Bradley Ellis. Yo. And you knew he was going to show up eventually. Maximilian, dude, how's it going, man? I'm from the unnamed third game already. Oh, shit. Mm. Yes, it's called very... Reunion Resurrection. Okay, thank you. I was going to ask you, Max, what you thought it was going to be called because... Oh, God. We, we, because we know it's going to come true, man. Like... People already pointing to uh, yeah. the stuff you were like talking about before, and like I saw people time stamping stuff that you were saying in, in the past. Yeah. Like, dude, the prophet. <laughs> but if you yeah. have, if, if you're watching this video, and you don't know why you were here. I'll explain it for you anyway. To be just being redundant, yo, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth trailer dropped, and uh, we need to talk about Final Fantasy VII. And last time we did this, mines exploded, um, and people went nuts. And you know what? We want to hopefully give you more of that. Not promising, but we'll see what goes down today as Max once again tries to enlighten us and expand our minds about the possibilities of where we're going. And I'm very excited because, man, like just seeing the little morsels we got was so satisfying. But just the interview remarks, or sorry, the, the Twitter statements they put out afterwards that the naming of these games is so important. Yeah. We called Remake It for a reason. You'll find out why we call this Rebirth. And it's like, oh, man, we're, we're in for a wild ride, aren't we? Yeah, because the assumption was that part two, and this is actually, I think, come as a detriment a little bit to, to Square and the FF7 Remake trilogy now. Where people are like, it's not called part two, right? It's not it's not called remake part two. It's called something else. So I've had a lot of people be like, what's rebirth? Where they don't oh, know. Oh, I get you. Where they are actually confused. People are actually confused by like, wait a minute. So this is the second one to that one we played a few years ago. And it's like, yes, this is actually the sequel to that. They're like, oh, why isn't it just called part two? Now, I'm like, I hate to tell you this, but remake was not describing what the game is, but the intentions of certain characters. And... I can tell you again as having to like re-describe a lot of this stuff again and revisit some of these like crackpot theories at the time. Um, many people did not pick up on this stuff, and I'm so I'm not surprised yeah. because it's not mm -hmm. clear. It's really it's like it's like a it's like a Dark Souls level, uh, you know, narrative where you got to really like look beyond just the surface level to see what the heck characters are doing. Yeah. I think that's pretty unfortunate because I think it's the concept has been really intriguing almost to the point of like I think it's like as a Final Fantasy 7 fan I feel it's like it's brilliant but you're absolutely right mm -hmm. like to, to like the average person who's just maybe like excited about these games look flashy cool everyone's talking about them this is like a marketing problem where yes. people don't fully yeah. grasp what they're buying like not quite as bad as like the dumb Wii the Wii U situation where like, oh I'm buying a peripheral but yeah when people go in and ask for part two you gotta hope that the salesperson or the uh, the, the person at the front's like oh you mean rebirth and they're like and they gotta yes. convince them like no i mean part two and they're like no you mean rebirth it's like, yes exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> and that's something that they'll have to tackle with like the naming conventions because obviously the naming conventions have really specific meaning now because they've officially said it and what each one is it's about like it's about like remaking a new or giving new life type of stuff so it's, it's remake it's rebirth two very similar words you know and apparently in in japanese like what rebirth is called is something also has like a double entendre oh really in okay. many ways and is about like you know creating a new type of thing creating something from something else and creating a new because rebirth isn't about a new birth no it's about being born again remaking something is about making something that was old and making it new again so the third one's going to be the exact same thing right it's going to be mm. something that like reanimated or it was seemingly <laughs> yeah. reunion would have been the best yeah, thing but that's not well, right mm -hmm. that's crisis core you know yeah yeah now i know you've got a bunch of stuff you want to unleash on this max but i actually do have a, a question i think an average final fantasy 7 fan will probably be wondering this it's one of the the, the biggest sure. things they might change and do you think they dare change it especially if they'd be calling rebirth and having mm -hmm. multiple meanings because a thing that gets born again is also a phoenix and we know phoenix downs are very important in final fantasy <laughs> so <laughs> i like this tip. and knowing how we're only getting three parts and how far this is going to go it's very likely yeah. that the death of Aerith might be in this sure. part do you think mm -hmm. these games are gonna play around with that expectation and do you think 
A, she does die, or B, do you think that there's a way to save her possibly, or do you think yeah. that's not happening? <laughs> I, oh, I think we're. I think this is officially a spoiler mode video now, so yep. that's good. We, 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 we've now reached the spoiler mode territory. Um, I'm curious what Brad has to say about that. Like, what, okay. do, you, what do you feel like they're gonna do? Your, so, on your end, Brad, I definitely think they're gonna tease the death throughout the game. Cloud is gonna get visions, more visions throughout, like what happened in the original game, and we will get to that moment where we, where she died in the original. It won't play out exactly the same, but she will die. I think by the end of all of this, everyone will end up exactly where they were in the original. Yep. They might not get there the same way, but all the characters we know that are still alive will be dead at some point. I don't... I could see them not killing her this part. It just depends where it ends, I guess, but... I feel like they're going to definitely toy with the player in that regard. So I think that's a really sound argument, because... And it's funny, I read a lot of takes of, like, they're going to kill Tifa instead. Yuffie's going to die instead. <laughs> and I'm like, hmm. so here's the funny thing about this whole this whole game is that outside of a very small percentage of part one, that game was brutally faithful. Mm -hmm. If it, in fact, was even more faithful in some ways and expanded on things in some ways you might have liked or, or not liked, uh, significantly more in, in the Midgar section of Final Fantasy VII. So, and, and considering the facts that the devs have said, that, that I think it's um, the, new, the new director of the game had mm -hmm. said multiple times uh, that, yeah, we want the players to still, uh, if you expect things, they were going to go there. If you remember things, we're still going to go there. So they don't, that's why this game is so big and they keep saying how big it is, because they know that they have to meet those expectations. So, why wouldn't that happen again? Right? Yeah. I mean, granted, you kill fate and this crazy Kingdom Hearts monster and all this crazy stuff happens at the end of, like, about through through 7 part 1 that makes a, makes, uh, is weird and different, but eventually they all end up on their way to calm, mm -hmm. you know, with very similar intentions. Zack is alive. We don't know how. The party doesn't know how, but, but in terms of the main character's story, yeah, they're all doing the exact same thing they were doing in the old game. Yep. So, yeah, to me, I agree with Brad completely. Why why would they deviate crazy from that, you know? Yeah. I, I, I agree with that argument, actually. I don't think... Playing with expectations is about as far as I think they'll go. But I think they're going to still land on the same places by the end. Sure. I absolutely think that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I do have a different question, but you did mention Zach. And before I forget, I, I both of you are big like Zach fans. I want to know what you think his involvement in Rebirth is going to be. Like, how is his role going to expand now that he is alive, either in this reality or in supposedly another reality? So, th this might be like a level three, bringing back the <laughs> <Yeah>. levels. <laughs> um, and and the, the a realization I had when I was reviewing uh, the Crisis Core trailer and the main trailer, and Zach says, Cloud says something really specific in the new trailer, and this, everything in that trailer is super curated, right? I feel like the gameplay footage is there to show off uh, a lot of the photogrammetry that UE5 can do. And I think it's like a direct demonstration of a lot of Unreal 5 elements, but just not a lot of gameplay stuff, obviously. I think everything is very specific as well as what characters are saying. And there is a spot of the trailer where, where Cloud says something um, about Zack that he does not say in the original game. And it's essentially an acknowledgement of Zack's existence. Uh, it's at some point in part two. So that and that comes that mm -hmm. doesn't come until way later, right? The, the mm -hmm. big revelation where he figures out who he actually is, spoiler mode. So the, the fact that there is already such a, a huge importance on Crisis Core Reunion, right? The level three is this. Crisis Core Reunion essentially reveals the gigantic M. Night Shyamalan twist of Final Fantasy VII, right? It, it, it makes that null and void. So... They're expecting the players to have played this game and know Zack's story and know what happens with Cloud, what actually happens, which essentially throws a complete wrench into the uh, the unreliable narrative of a lot of what happens in the original FF7, including including even him telling the story in Calm and stuff like that. So they're ruining what is essentially the part three, like end of end of disc two big reveal. The biggest twist of the game is essentially ruined. So what's there to make up for it? 
And that's mm. that's the thing is like whatever yeah. they, whatever they have planned is worth letting the players know and reminding you and literally telling you go buy this other game that ties all the story together so you understand this even but even you understanding this by ruining what Cloud's character technically is there's got to be something else and that's that's where I don't know where it goes man I don't I don't know I have no idea what the hell no Jima <laughs> oh, no. and Gatase are planning <laughs> that that's that's levels beyond where I'm even understanding where they're actually taking the story but it seems that the relationship with Cloud and Zack and what they're what they went through is technically more important than Cloud's big you know it's a twist you know mm. kind of reveal at the end of the game yeah, I, uh, I'm just thinking about like what they're gonna. Okay, so if we know as the players the whole revelation about Cloud and Zack, their sure. whole kind of thing, and they expect us to play Crisis Core before this, I am wondering, <laughs> could totally happen, if they're gonna tie in Angeal, Genesis more into a whole this like maybe Cloud will have flashbacks with them somehow tied into the flashbacks, even though they weren't in the original game. Yeah. I'm I mean, just trying to think what they could add to us to make us question things without knowing everything. Because they have sure. to do something now. Because what's the what's the big what's yeah, the elephant what's the, in the room? Yeah. The elephant in the room is wearing a red cloak. Yeah. And <laughs> and is a J pop star. Yeah. Uh the, the big elephant in the room is like, is Gact gonna come back? You know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't think like Cloud having revelatory moments about Genesis or like Angeal is really important to Cloud. It's right not. with what's yeah. it's not. Like in fact, like Sephiroth is Cloud's <clears throat> main bad guy. And to Zach, the the big the big focus of Crisis Core is that um it, and Jill's part of the story technically like practically ends halfway through the game. Mm -hmm. uh, spoiler mode because he dies and then Zach gets much older and it's all about like this what's happening with Genesis so Genesis is the big bad guy of like crisis core that's what they build up to in many ways right mm -hmm. so if anything if, if, if Genesis is relevant in remake part 2 to me it makes the most sense that that's related to alive Zach right mm -hmm. because we all we all are brutally hyper aware that Genesis didn't actually die you know that he he does live on and he carried weiss's husk of a hojo's stupid corpse mm -hmm. into the sky with his one wing like a weird asshole uh at the end of dirge of cerberus so it's like that's a round right and they're and they're clearly at the beginning of that presentation the part where it was scrolling over all the text and i'm like don't do it and then it starts going dirge of cerberus i'm like mm -hmm. Okay, man, here we go. <laughs> it's, it's canon whether we like it or not. So I don't know. Like I my I, I I'm I'm sort of thinking that but what's going on with Zach, like how, mm -hmm. how is Zach related? I think all that stuff that happened at the end of like pre UV <laughs> DLC, the bag and you know, the the stamp thing, or whatever the heck that dog's name was, it's been a couple years. Mm -hmm. But like all that stuff is there very purposefully and it's all still making sense why Zack is back at the end of the Yuffie DLC and Aerith is seemingly gone slash dead is the impression that that scene gives because they're in a, I, I think Zack's in a different timeline. I yeah, think that's the definitely. whole point, right? Yeah, so a lot a of different Zack, different cloud maybe too. Exactly. So I, I, I still think they're going to be toying with that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be a big part of part two where you essentially get your characters on your main adventure and somewhere out there, it seems like Zach is on his own adventure. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it would be really, I, I, I just, I'm like thinking of like, what do you do with that? Like, how do you, how do you fuck with the player in those situations? Because maybe the players don't actually realize they're two different timelines. And it just seems like Aerith is missing or something like that. Right. I maybe, wonder if, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go I, I ahead. wonder if since the uh, like cloud, they're all kind of linked with the Genova cells. I wonder if they will be on these separate timelines, but getting visions of what each of them are doing in different timelines, almost. Yeah. Something to connect them. Because in the Rebirth trailer, there's that white feather. And I'm trying to remember, is that Angeal's That's wing color? The, the closest that could be is either like Angeal, maybe representative of Aerith. But if we're, if we're talking specifically like Black Feather, Sephiroth, White Feather usage in previous, you know, media, mm -hmm. the White Feather is Angeal. Uh, I don't know if Angeal's gonna be a force ghost, uh, or if that ever really happened much in Crisis Core. It's been a long, it's been like a year, yeah. a couple years since I played it, but I, I don't know. You know, I think mm -hmm. that's just like that. That white feather is only ever in the in the shots where 
uh, Zach is alive. So mm. I think that more is a is a metaphor slash symbolism that yeah this is his own timeline where it's mm -hmm. like Zach lived and Angeal, you know yeah. like d it, 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 Zach's like uh, unfortunate fate didn't happen and Angeal's like sort of happy that he's alive kind of thing that could be what that means yeah I I just like <clears throat> sorry if Zach and Cloud are like a separate timeline and we have our party that we know of like they're gonna have to link in some way yeah. Something is going to have to happen between these characters meeting each other or connecting so, uh, mentally. And I'm just like, what are they going to do? Here's my here's where the first part of it made a, and sense how they could do it, where they're essentially doing their own things, right? Where they, they eventually both sides of the party might have their own goals, where Zach might get a very similar party um, with Cloud as like an additional member of the party. But Zach's like mm -hmm. the leader and they're both going on their way to like what is eventually the northern crater. Mm -hmm. uh, because potentially in Zach's timeline, in, in, in our timeline of FF7, it makes complete sense that we're on the way the to the Northern Crater to essentially deliver the Black Materia to Sephiroth, right? Events right. will play out in a very similar fashion. But in Zach's timeline, that's not the case. Um, would it even be Sephiroth in the Northern Crater in Zach's timeline? That doesn't make sense to me either. Mm. That ma mm. it makes a lot more sense that that would be Genesis or something like that. Right. So in the bad guy in Zack's timeline could be could be like some crazy version of Genesis, like in some way. Mm. Like I don't know how they do it. It won't. It won't he won't be like stuck in, in the exact same way because Sephiroth got scooped up through the life stream of the Nebo reactor and chucked into a crazy space rock. Mm -hmm. Like that's going to be completely different how he's up there. But to me, it would make a lot more sense if you were to inject Genesis into some way. It might be the bad guy on Zack's timeline. That might make a bit more sense. I, this is yeah, just a theory of like, yeah, you know, there's a I, reason that they're doing all this stuff. I don't love it, you know. I'm right. curious how they'll handle it, but it makes sense to me. Yeah, like if they do do that, I wonder how long that would be though of you playing this, if you even play that side of the party, because you're gonna have the whole story of like Cloud and Tifa and sure. all of them doing everything. I'm like, how much can you actually fit in? So this and, there, and this is the, the 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 running theory that we had at the end of uh, part one, where it's like, so how do you handle that? Like, what what is that like? Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, it's like FF8. It was like Laguna mm -hmm. bits, oh, where they're right. they're essentially doing and the best part of FF8. <laughs> sorry, uh, <laughs> where <true>. they're they're <laughs> essentially doing you know a, a very focused party thing with your main crew, and then you get like dream sequences, little bits mm -hmm. of this alternate reality kind of thing that's happening with other characters and like i think that was another timeline i have i could not tell you i've played ff8 once in mm -hmm. 1999 uh but i'm pretty sure that's what it what's what laguna's side was was like an alternate version so mm -hmm. that that could happen where you sort of get like tidbits of it and it how cool would it be if it seems like zach is alive if it seems like all this stuff is taking place but eventually they actually reach a certain spot like where they get to nibelheim at the exact same time and Aerith would like feel like a premonition like exactly she had at the end of part one and she turns around you're expecting Zack to be there because they're literally walking up on each other and no one's actually there and they just pass yeah. by because they're in, they're in different places they're in different timelines I, I was going to ask you about cool. this because Aerith seems to be one of the only ones who possibly knows what's going on sure. and seeing these alternate things like her and Sephiroth are kind of the two things in terms of these characters meeting, do you think Aerith is the key to that? Maybe some of, like, maybe her death or her not dying at what we thought fucks up the timeline or some shit sure. like that. And she is the reason that these things cross over. And if she doesn't die, things will get really fucked up. She's like, no, I, I have to die, essentially. Because she kind of goes to die in the first, or the I original like this game, I guess you could say. I like this idea. And she's like, I gotta die to set things right. You know, then... Cloud's having to deal with that, and Zach also. Yeah, I, I kind of, I was thinking about that, and I kind of loved the idea that, obviously, Cloud already subconsciously knows she's gonna die. Like, mm -hmm. the bitch on screen tear cried, and didn't understand why he did in the middle of an alleyway when he was talking to her, and it's like, what? Like, what am I seeing? And he doesn't know. So, he clearly has, like, a memory of what's happened before, because this is a sequel, mm -hmm. and there is, there is already an inclination that that's gonna be the case, where 
you can sort of hang that above the player's head like a wonderful carrot on a string where Cloud, by the time he gets to certain parts, so as you get closer and closer to the Forgotten City, um, is aware of it, right? And might even, like, tell the other party and everybody that, like, yeah, like, she's not going to make it. Like, I know she's not going to... We have to save her. And even Aerith, like, knows it, right? Mm -hmm. But how how great of it, it would it be if, like, Aerith is just, like, acting and she she knows that she's she's going to bite the dust. Like, this is the way, like, it kind of yeah. has to go type of thing. Like, in every situation, it's like a Doctor Strange moment. Like, I've been through this all many times and in every single way, I can't be around. Like, ooh, shit. That, mm -hmm. I think that burns even worse where, you know, in any situation, even in maybe the Zack timeline as well, where no matter how this all works out, she has to die. And yeah. there's this this looming thing above the player's head the whole time that like you can save her, Phoenix mm -hmm. Downs revive people, you know all this stuff that just like that, that, that is like littered throughout the story. I think false hope is the best thing yes. that you yes. could give the player, and then you just take it away from them all over again because he is, obviously Aerith's death is one of the most impactful moments in video game history, video game storytelling. Everybody, it's like Luke is my father, Aerith dies, you know, like like I'm sorry, Vader is my father. <laughs> Luke is my father. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Aerith dies. So those those things are so like in tandem known throughout film and video game history that there's no way to make this, you know, a secret. Mm -hmm. So you have to do something with it. And I think that's one of the best things you could do with it is to just give false hope. Let me yeah go back to what we're talking about. This is related to what we we're just talking about, but also back we 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 talked about like deaths and expectations, and that you, both of you kind of felt that. Things are still going to land where they should land based on the blueprint of the original game. Right. Um, one thing we've seen that they're going to have to do a lot of work to get back to that point with the end of Remake was that we see certain characters who should have died are alive and not just Zack. Mm -hmm. Talking about seeing Biggs recovering in, oh, yeah. in the room. And what about Jesse is, you know, did, did like did she maybe also survive and it's like yeah are we gonna end up seeing them again so like a yeah, a, yeah. so how do you how do they get to handle that um I, okay so yeah. jesse i think you'll see at gold saucer okay. when you go there in the play that goes on she will be in the play yeah as an actor because they set that up too much yeah to and too I, much it did it didn't eventually have a payout it just like abruptly ends and it was yeah. sad but it seems like okay there's this is going somewhere like here's, here's my question oh, for God. you brad yeah. Which timeline does that take place in? That, okay, that's a really good question. I think it's going to be in the Cloud and Co. timeline for now. I think so, too. I think that'll be in that timeline. <clears throat> and like Max said, I think a lot about this game is going to be us being teased of what the fate of these characters was originally. And the game giving you false hope. Yeah. Not necessarily maybe Jesse dying in this game, but... Making you believe that there is hope to save these characters. And I think Aerith is going to be the one, like you said, to be like, no, there is nothing you can do kind of thing. We all have to end up exactly where we are. I don't know if that's a part three thing culminating at the end with like Zack there also fighting Sephiroth with yeah. you or something like that. But or maybe sure. you know some crazy because i've we've been comparing a lot over the couple of years that like sephiroth in part one especially is essentially treated like a darth vader character mm -hmm. instead of like a jaws which is he, he's a jaws in the original ff7 where he pops up at a very limited period of time just for like shock value and then eventually like big reveal type <laughs> thing uh no like now he's darth vader roaming around and fucking shit up and you know causing hell and havoc like okay okay so like he's a he's a different entity in in this game for sure in part one for sure mm -hmm. so my my biggest concern is that they try to actually darth vader sephiroth and it's like you could save sephiroth and i'm like oh. that would that would be the worst. Yeah, like, no. do not make Sephiroth not the bad guy to, like, team up against Genova or something like that, where it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. you team up with Sephiroth to fight. No, please don't do that. And that that's in, that that had come into my, my mental capacity that mm -hmm. they could potentially, like, reverse bad guy Sephiroth, and I just don't think that's a good idea. Considering he's yeah. the bad guy through and through of the original, don't do that. I don't think that's a good idea either. I think maybe they could give you that impression at a point i don't think 
you're gonna team up with Sephiroth though to like beat a big bad kind of thing. Sure. He's just too fucking evil, man. He's too fucking evil. He's, yeah, yeah. You just can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I hope they. I really hope they don't go that 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 <laughs> yeah. Vader route. There's already so many like Star Wars innuendos and references. Yeah, there and should even... be no Sephiroth redemption or anything yeah. like that. Man. So, and it, the, the funniest thing about that those quotes that we were just talking about from from the directors and the big one from um, it was from was it Yoshida? No, no, no. Who's who is the big producer Kitase? of the game? Kitase. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, where Kitase was specifically mentioning the uh, the filmic references, how like part two. Uh, in in many trilogies in trilogies of the past or trilogy in movies is like the most beloved one and it's like okay so they're they're building up that this game's going to be really big and have a lot of character drama and contention and stuff is going to happen here just like the just like disc one and two of the old game um so the weird thing is that in some old interviews it might not be empire strikes back that he's referring to as like the greatest sequel one of the greatest sequels like of film history which they're which they're obviously taken notes from it might not be empire strikes back it might be because he's he, he name dropped this movie specifically in a really old interview from like 2015 he name dropped godfather 2 oh mm. so that also leads me to like mm, for one i might need to see godfather 2 in full again but at the same time like that that movie is the way it is because and is so beloved in so many ways because of how how its characters collide in the story and stuff like that and it doesn't come out with an exact like you know like here's a cake and everyone's happy like no there's mm -hmm. a lot of really sad shit and stuff like that from what i remember so anyway i i thought that was kind of interesting where it's like it comes across as an empire strikes back situation and it definitely is because at the end of part two like clouds frozen in carbonite somewhere type shit we had to go find mm -hmm. him go on an adventure to go find han solo it's like the same shit so i don't know man i i feel like they're I feel like they want to break hearts, you know? I feel like that's that's like the whole point is to break everyone's heart all over again. Yeah, that makes me wonder if do you think like maybe Sephiroth will talk to someone whether it's Cloud or whatever, but they kind of think that maybe he's not so crazy almost. Like maybe Sephiroth does some mind games to Cloud this time around even more so. And Cloud's like maybe he's right yeah. kind of thing. Like I have to do this to prevent you know you from dying or you from dying or something yeah. like that i don't think that's really weird because it's just an expansion of what already happens to cloud cloud right. nearly kills Aerith twice because he's being puppeted by sephiroth in the original game when uh when uh, uh what's it called temple of the ancients disappears mm -hmm. and turns into the black materia there's like a very wide shot of him like beating the shit out of Aerith or something. It's like, what yeah. is going on? It's you have to like almost interpret it. And it's like Cloud is his younger teenage self is trying to stop him because that's the one that's who Cloud actually is. And then there's the moment right before Aerith actually dies where Cloud's about to literally impale her. Yeah. And then he's able to get get control of it and stop. So there's there's already and there's just going to be expansions of that where like Sephiroth is essentially in his head and you're mm -hmm. just going to you're just going to feel that a bit more in the same way that like Sephiroth has been haunting Cloud's brain in part one, which is why he shows up even more because he is literally in his brain. Uh, yeah, that's. That shit's going to be brutal in part two, considering how well it was handled in part one already. Like, I, mm -hmm. that's going to be heartbreaking. And that leads to the question, like, is Cloud going to be the one to actually axe Aerith this time? Like, I don't think so. Oh, but I think I think there's those <laughs> that is definitely that he's going to have maybe dreams of it or something. He'll have a dream of it and it'll be yeah. in PS1 graphics. Oh, <laughs> that's that's, that's my the, crazy theory. That would be crazy. <laughs> I, think it, I think it'd go really off the deep end and like yeah. have cloud do the deed and zach's alive to witness it like that's the moment he or reconnects some crazy shit like yeah, yeah oh zach sees God. it and it's Terrible. like that sets up part three where like now zach and cloud are like we're not good dude <laughs> you just killed my girl yeah i i think it's definitely like well, all this co like like dual timeline stuff of like maybe that's setting up for the fact that why why Jesse could potentially be alive, why Biggs is alive, why Wedge might actually be alive. I, I was thinking about this a lot where at the end of the preview at the end of part one, Biggs wakes up alive somewhere, right? In mm -hmm. in in the orphanage, right? We don't know if it's the same orphanage that we actually visited earlier in the appropriate time frame, right? In the in the clouds timeline. That could be a different technical 
like either a different bigs or the time jannies and fate being destroyed screws up stuff so much that stuff actually crosses over in between yeah so how how cool how, i was i was only thinking how cool this would be if biggs wakes up and he's like i made it wow this is crazy let me go talk to my friends and nobody's where they should be and eventually he has to meet up with zach because he's in the wrong timeline i'm like that would be fucking nuts if that if they mm. did if and if and if yeah if jesse somehow makes it and she's still in like cloud's timeline and she she's sir she because like, normally jesse might have survived zach's timeline right well that would actually make sense but then she gets zipped over in the same way that Biggs gets zipped over because the time Janny screwed everything up and you get to the golden saucer and yeah she eventually just made it to the golden saucer but she has no idea who you are that, that starts to make be, a lot of yeah. sense yeah. why there's there's timeline shit crossing in between and that might be the stuff that will really make your adventure to uh the northern reactor really unique and very different because mm -hmm. you can start to they can start to get some weird crazy shit that happens because you don't know what's going on in the other timeline you really don't have an understanding of what that reality is like where cloud lived and zach lived and how much that screwed stuff up so yeah i think it's just more more stuff of like weird reality distortion because that's that's all a huge part of ff7 original where cloud has this thing talking to him throughout the whole game and you don't know what the hell's going on and you just you don't you don't understand that until like you know the big twist 45 hours in or something like that yeah mm -hmm. it seems like it could be really fun that would be a good i think that'd be a, a good replacement for the going the unreliable narrator path like this is what they do instead is that Maybe that's you're, worth you're, 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 sacrificing. Yeah, maybe this is what they can do instead of what you're talking about earlier. Um, you don't think any, like, we keep talking about these as two realities or possibly two different timelines. Like, it's, I thought it was pretty clear, but I, I've seen some talk about potentially, like, the characters who were supposed to die who are still alive, potentially this, like, one of the realities being it's a purgatory. They did die, and they just, like, they're stuck in a purgatory or something like that. Do you think there's any give any credence to that, or you think that's missing the mark? I, th I mean, I, I think based on a, a, a lot of the stuff we've seen the timeline thing seems pretty sound but they, they could take it whatever direction they want so yeah. I, I wouldn't say that that's like you know oh no way like that theory doesn't make any sense because they could just do it <laughs> you know mm -hmm. they could just they could just explain the stamp bag and all that stuff in just whatever way they wanted uh but yeah like uh, the idea that zach is essentially like witnessing all this stuff and he thinks he's caring the only the only thing that makes me not think that is that at the end of the yuffie dlc uh, right like yeah we get some direct interpretations that what's happening in this timeline is different right he's not just witnessing what's happening to zach and the party i'm sorry to cloud and the party from like an outside like in between sort of perspective so we've already seen a couple of examples that he's alive somewhere mm -hmm. but i i don't even think we're gonna get that as a reveal in part two they're gonna you hold know? that till the end. Right. Yeah, I, I think they're gonna hold that shit until a while. I think well, there'll be another. By the way, are we all kind of in agreeing that Crisis Core Reunion is gonna have like a cutscene or something? Yes. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. definitely gonna Ab have something absolutely. new. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Like, there's gonna be a thing like after the credits, after he dies, after the big emotional payout happens, and then he gets up. You know, and it's like yeah. it, it it follows a similar pattern, but now we actually see it all happen, maybe, you know, in tandem. So it makes a bit more sense. He leaves Cloud at a train station or some shit. I don't know. Like, but we actually see maybe what is of Aerith in into that version of Zack at the end of the uh, like the, the Yuffie DLC. I think they have to do that. They have to tie this in a little bit more, but not directly answer. It's mm -hmm. like like president shinra doesn't come up in the screen and go it's two timelines and then he just ducks away like you're not gonna get <laughs> you're not gonna get like they're just gonna throw it right in front of your face uh the the only time you're gonna get a bigger inclination from a character in the story that goes like here's the story jazz hands is gonna be Bugenhagen. that and that is part yeah. two damn yeah they yeah they'll they gotta add like a little yeah. something just a little a little tease letting you know like yeah so it's all connected now. yeah it's 100 mm -hmm. especially since it's coming out before like apps absolutely it's part of the plan yeah a year before, they, and they yeah. they want you to play it oh. like it's pretty mm -hmm. clear it has its own new subtitle and that isn't 
once again, reunion isn't like, oh, it's a reunion of these characters after so long. It's the reunion of HD visuals from SD visuals. That's what, no, 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 no. The subtitles in Final Fantasy VII games do not refer to gameplay things. They directly refer to story things. It's a reunion in a different way that is going to be revealed probably at the very, very end. Mm-hmm. And so this this is going to be called the the compilation of re Final Fantasy VII since everything in yeah. it. So man, were they ever, when all this is over, do you think they give us a new version of Advent Children, like a Advent Children re something where they redo the movie? <laughs> 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 a, we don't really need to get into that. That's just, just for fun, man. But, yeah, <laughs> that, that sort of leads into like the, yeah. the 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 ongoing where it's like after part three is out, do you think they stop making Final Fantasy games, Final Fantasy VII games? <laughs> Hell no, dude. Uh, no, uh, no, no, nope. this doesn't stop. Do you sure. think these characters just stop after part three is out and it makes a ton of money? It's, it's, yeah. This is their like their franchise Final Fantasy outside of the main Final Fantasy, right? It's like FF7 mm-hmm. is practically its own big franchise. The only other one that was the closest was 13. And that technically like stopped. I don't think we're getting a new 13 anytime soon. No. So... Yeah, of course they're going to keep going. They keep making too much money. Like, the licensing mm-hmm. alone for FF7 is probably worth just as much as what the game's sales make. Yeah. yeah. I think they'll find a way to try and keep it going in some capacity. Maybe it won't be, like, the, the full-blown, like, like a sequel trilogy type thing. But yeah. there's obviously, like, games that, like, you know, there's Avid Children. There's Dirge. They could go revisit as much as a lot of people don't like Dirge. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, they could be another crack at them to kind of like rehabilitate the image of that game by like making a new version that's actually good this time around. You know, who knows what they're going to do with that. And eventually at the end of this whole story, like we're going to get a conclusion that is much different than what the original Final Fantasy VII is and how it concludes and what it sets up for, what it sets up for. So... Dude. Like they can do whatever they want. All I, all I, all I got to say is that like if they are setting up for something, this crazy story, which is essentially a, a now thirty, no, we're twenty five years of FF seven, twenty five year plus story of the original Final Fantasy seven, and the compilation is like coming to a head, and now we're getting close to seeing where it's going and what it could lead to. It has to have a super satisfying conclusion, right? Mm-hmm. It's got to have something that like feels absolutely great and you're super satisfied that you spent this like 10 year multi-game journey through a, like a like 100 to 250 to 200 hour journey with all these characters you know like it has to be worth it if they're gonna set up for something else if they're if there's something else like down the line where it's like another character story or vincent's doing some weird shit you know that's got to be worth it in some right. way yeah mm-hmm. you can't you can't mess with this i I'm gonna go off the rails here, because Please. because the, the the I think Final Fantasy VII is their most popular Final Fantasy. I think this could lead into a, a transition to something else, another reimagining and in, in a, a rebirth of another seri- uh, Final Fantasy, which should have been a, potentially a trilogy. I think it'd be insane if all this ended and like it's like credits roll, blah blah blah. We've seen all the twists and stuff. Like after, don't you connect this to ten? And literally, you see Titus swim up it. to the surface oh. because oh the God. Shinra reference in there and that 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 photo in the in the Shinra office. They're like, oh yeah, we're going there. <laughs> like we're connecting this all the Final Fantasy if ten. If there's one thing you're I getting... can trust Damiani to do <laughs> is to always connect it to ten. In some it's way. going there it's, 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 because it has to just naturally like get off the plane. <laughs> <laughs> and like here we're at Final Fantasy X now. Here you go. Like it just lets you off. The twist is gonna be like something with like the ancients or Genova, like a Genova landed like on that planet or whatever. It's like oh, <laughs> oh, because they hey they wanted to make ten three. They have the stupid audio log which. They they like they've teased it for forever, man. Final Fantasy X is probably the most popular Final Fantasy right after seven. And mm. if they like seven, they could keep doing it, like making more games after. But I think they run the risk of diminishing returns, kind of like oversaturating it. I think they do have a planned stopping point. But this concept of revisiting a Final Fantasy and like doing it in this style, I think that there's a next prime target for that. It would be ten in Ten's universe. And there yeah. is that loose remark that pseudo connects the two games, but Square Enix wants to go down that rabbit hole. They absolutely could do that. Like, th- imagine the reactions people have when they beat like whatever the third one's called, and there's a post credit scene, and it's just fucking tedious. <laughs> like, people would just be like going like absolutely bonkers. <laughs> like, wait, what am yeah. I watching? It, it, would be, it would be crazy, 
but yeah. I would almost think it would be a disservice to Final Fantasy VII fans. Because <laughs> if there's if there's one thing about like, and I, I, I might I might also echo this, like why FF7 ended up becoming big, why it's popular, like there there's a lot of people, including myself, that really like Final Fantasy VII and don't as much like all the other Final Fantasies. And that is something that I, I think that they might ha also have a bit of like market knowledge of, right? Of like their audience and who they're who they're making this for. It is one of those games that sort of like was st was very different from all the other games around it when it came out, and it was like a pinnacle game. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, if you have a PlayStation, you have to play this shit, you know. So a lot of people that might not even have liked JRPGs ended up i mean i can only say this for myself and like a lot of people in my audience that that echo a very similar sentiment they didn't love jrpgs but they like ff7 ff7 made me play a lot of jrpgs around the playstation era and really discover the genre when i was the, i was the luckiest person in the world because i literally had the best system to do that on so after uh, me i sort of grew into like and all the other final fantasies and sort of like playing a whole bunch of them uh many ones from the future but it's really like a standalone thing in the same way that like a lot of fighting game players like their one thing. I like my one thing. You know, I like my characters of my one thing. I like the one thing where this one thing plays. I don't like this other thing. Like uh, there's I think there's a d decent chunk of the audience that's like that for FF7, unfortunately. Yeah. To not be so outlandish, I don't like. I do not think this is going to happen. I think this is being. Said. I think it'll but, happen. But, is what I, I'm but trying to I, say. yeah, I, I, but I think <laughs> at some point they might try and do this Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy Ten. But it'd be isolated. It'd be its own thing. Like maybe ten yeah. years from now or something. The same way mm -hmm. they're doing this. But uh, no, I completely agree with what you say. And I think they. Were, it's not even like a guess. It's like 100% fact. Like the reverence for Final Fantasy VII, even within Square Enix, they know how important this is and they wouldn't do anything crazy like that to like jeopardize. It's a golden goose. Exactly. Like, not, like it has to remain kind of like untarnished, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say untarnished, but the compilation exists. It's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dirge exists. Vin Vincent <laughs> eventually kills the bad guy at the end of that with a with a huge <laughs> space laser using the power of love and friendship. Yeah. Like that happens at some point in that game for God's sake. Yeah. So just, yeah. you know, let, let's pick and choose the stuff that we use from the compilation, please. Let's yeah. let's handle it in the same way like part one. Yeah. Tommy, honey, oh. the one thing I'll accept in Final, if they have Final Fantasy X stuff oh, is I was, yeah. people playing Blitzball. Hey. If they're playing Blitzball at Costa del Sol or Gold Saucer, that, I'll take that. I'll take that I'll nod. If like a Blitzball is in Costa del Sol, I'll take that. That that will be a nice yeah, little, little nod. Go. That, that'll be Otherwise, the best thing no if thing. the yeah. kids are kicking around a Blitzball. Yes. That would be yeah. probably the best way to like to nod, if or, not tie in, like just just to like be hey, something's there. I got a good, I got a good segue here, or it could potentially be in Gold Saucer as a mini game because one yep. thing I want to ask yeah. you about is do you, we expect do, hey do you, we expect Gold oh. Saucer to be in here and the scale of it? What do you expect from Seven yeah. Rebirths Gold Saucer, man? So uh, I think the scalability is a great conversation. I think I think outside of like crazy story theories of where these characters are going, which is the most unknown territory that we're in right now, I think something that is a bit more grounded and what we can talk about is how is gameplay going to change how is mm. our traversal of the world going to change and how much is going to be in part two and i'm pretty ambitious right i don't think this ends at forgotten city i don't think it ends with Aerith's death end of disc one i mm -hmm. don't think so i i think this leads all the way up to uh northern crater okay and and eventually like the, the, I think I think the, the story like this has been my long time theory before we even knew it was a trilogy uh, that the last thing you see is everything at its most dour clouds presumed cloud is dead or presumed missing Sephiroth got the black materia Tifa and Barrett are imprisoned about to be executed and Barrett opens the window that Sephiroth got what he wanted. There's a giant meteor that's literally mm. going to kill everybody, mm. you know, cut to credits like that. There is your there is your like really, really crazy, like Lord of the Rings ending type of thing that mm. is like, Jesus, where are the characters going to go from here type of thing if you don't know. So to me, that to me, I think we're going to get everything from calm all the way to the northern crater in part two. I actually think they're going to fit that much in the game. That was, that's a lot. <laughs> I'm just trying to think, like, what are you going to do for part three, then? It, 
Is it just going to be like all brand new stuff? Oh, are you ready? <laughs> yes. Please. Are you ready? Let's, go. Let's get down so, this rabbit hole. So part, yeah, part two and uh, like like disc two is such a huge like part of FF7 of some of the best stuff that happens. And the nice part about part three, it's a lot of revisiting. You're going back mm -hmm. to places, but there's new things happening. The big world event that takes place in FF7 is in part three is the fact that, yes, Meteor is coming to kill everybody. All the towns are going to be different now. They're going to be like ransacked. People are going to be acting much differently in, 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 in Remake Part 3. That the world is about to die. Everyone's going to have much different ways of interpreting this than the original game where like nothing really changes and people say some minor different things. I think there's, there's a reason to change a lot of the world events because everyone thinks the world is going to die. And then mm -hmm. there's also the big one there is like seven kaijus that were just released on the planet and they're just <laughs> fucking shit up everywhere. Like the yeah. planet is defending itself. So, and then there's the other, the other big one, like the first big reveal at the end of, or the beginning of part three, what's different from part two to part three, you have an airship. You, you don't, mm -hmm. you're not traveling on a tiny Bronco or like a buggy or Chocobo or anything like that. Like now you can just go around the world. So gameplay wise, part three and traversal is very different, you know, as far as how the world is engaged. So you have an airship, kaijus, everyone's acting differently, towns will be different. But at the same time, what is the big difference from like, how do you, how do you fill that with content? Well, in, in my opinion, you just make a whole game out of what the player actually does in, in disc two to disc three. Because what are you doing? You want to go kill those kaijus, right? Mm -hmm. You want to go mm -hmm. hunt these things. They have to be stopped. They're killing people. This is this is more important than that thing that is going to eventually get here. We have to deal with that, but maybe taking care of the shit on the ground, all the monsters, will actually help us stop the thing in the sky. There's all these materia caves, these ancient legends of of old materia that came from, you know, the, the Cetra littered throughout the world. Maybe that's actually part of the story now. Maybe Knights of the Round is part of the story <laughs> where you you have to you have to breed chocobos as part of the story. There's places our airships can't get to that we've only heard about. We have to get a big fucking chicken that is covered in gold. That's the only way we could get over. Like to me, creating all of that stuff and instead of like all the, the extra bonus side mission things that really make FF7 really fun in the original, I think putting that all into the narrative would be so sick that we actually have to take out all these monsters and this is like a part of the narrative now mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. before we go to the northern crater and eventually fight sephiroth but then you also have like the submarine shit you have a whole underwater part of the game like there's there's yeah. there's actually quite a bit in part three and the part three is just a big epic we're just it's a big globe trotting epic epic of taking out these kaijus and shit so hmm. to, at that point part three sounds pretty fucking awesome that you can make a whole game around that yeah that, yeah, I guess you could do that. The only thing, I guess, you're revisiting a lot of areas, like you said, they would have to change quite a bit, I guess, so they don't feel exactly the same as part Sure, two. exactly. Hmm. Yeah. But there, yeah, there's a good I, reason to change stuff. Like, things just, I mean, obviously a lot of the work of part two is going to go directly into part three. It's pretty clear. Mm -hmm, like, tra mm -hmm. world traversal, battle mechanics, like, a lot of things are just going to carry directly over, and that stuff takes the most time. Like, how is our game played? So... You, do, you have a reason to change stuff like things there'll be banners and graffiti everywhere like people will be fucking shit up because the world is going to end how does how does this world react to an eventual apocalypse event mm -hmm. uh, all right max you, you, you're talking about the the world and like if by that point if we have all that it's gonna be a pretty big game like being able to visit all those worlds but the biggest question that needs to be answered before you get there in part two is you're talking about world traversal. How is that? How do you think that's going to go down? Especially in YouTube, Brad, I know you kind of mentioned this to me on the podcast last night when we were talking about the 16 stuff, which is probably what I guess your, your answer is going to be for this, but how do they handle like the, the game in terms of like zones, it, like the, when you're going across like the old map, the world map, like, is it just going to be interconnected large environments or do you think there's going to be a bit of open world? Like, how, how do you think this is going to work? And yeah, by the end, how is it like, is the airship just going to be a thing you get on and just like insta warp to places or do you actually get to fly around in it a bit? Oh, you want me to go first? Either, yeah, either of you. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. I think, yeah, it'll be like just interconnected zones that are some are will be really big. Like. There's going to be, like, the huge field with the Chocobo farm, you know, and the snake. You'll be riding around your Chocobo. And as for the airship, I I wonder if they really want you to 
fly it actually, but that would require <laughs> that I, airship's I really huge. It's it a is. big ass airship. And, so. I, and I don't think that happens in part two either. No. You know? Yeah, I think airships Yeah, maybe part three. Some like elevating or escalating your traversal through the world. Something mm-hmm. like definitely gonna have chocobos in part one in the buggy probably. Chocobos buggy and you get um Tiny Bronco. Tiny maybe? Bronco. Uh, a, 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 a tiny water Bronco based that'll work. Yeah. Oh, for a, water. A water based propeller plane. Okay. You know? Mm-hmm. Like that, and that's just like, in the same way that like I think the original FF Seven was the 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 natural world opens up in a I hate this word a wide linear kind of way where it mm-hmm. feels like it's big and open, but it's absolutely focused. You're only going the one way unless people glitch the hell out of some mountains or shit, which people have done. Uh, you you're only gonna get you're only gonna cross that river if you have this Bronco. You're only gonna cross that part of the ocean if you have like the buggy <clears throat> or something like that, or vice versa. You're only gonna get across this field if you have a chick. You know, there will be parts of the game that you're essentially locked out of until you continue story stuff and get from part A to part B. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And that just that's the original game. I mean, yeah. that's really, mm-hmm. you know, I think I think people just wanting the original game with just bigger zones and stuff like that is fine, you know, and it's all yeah. interconnected. Mm-hmm. There's no loading like that makes a lot of that's sense. Exactly what I want. I mean, I, I was happy when I heard 16 was going to do that. I was like, thank you for because they when I it mentioned it's going to be globe trotting. Especially Final Fantasy VII, there's so many places you go to that can't make that all open world. Like, that would never work. Yeah. The game would take, like, 20 years yeah. to make. So it's like, this is where I'd hope it was going to go. And, and and Hamaguchi, who's, like, the new director, uh, people might not be aware, but, yeah, he was, he was, like, a co-director of Part 1. He is now the lead director of Part 2, and Nomura got moved to a creative director yeah. assignment. So, mm-hmm. and it was already presumed that, yeah, Hamaguchi was, like, the primary director already of part one because it or it, the game didn't feel super no Murian all the time and he was obviously still working on Kingdom Hearts at the time as well and they has the number has to do with a lot of projects at any given time and of course this one is really important but the fact that Hamaguchi is now the lead of the most important game of all of them which is technically part two is pretty mm-hmm. big and the dude has gone on quote I think twice saying how much he loves Horizon Zero Dawn and how much he was looking forward to the sequel. Was This was like a year and a half ago or something like that. So I don't think we're going to get a world exactly like, like an open world like Horizon. But I think having a lot of stuff from that. Between like mm-hmm. side quests. Between like random dungeons or small things that just happen. The way they, the way they make their world feel alive. Is probably going to be something really similar that they do in 7. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, a huge area and you see, like, those big-ass snakes, you know, kind of wandering around in the distance, something like that, making them feel like they're more on the map rather than just, like, a special event encounter. Like, sure. maybe you could just seamlessly walk up to one of those snakes and just fight it Man, or something. I mean, yeah. that's what I'm hoping. Heck yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, like, one of the tenets of the Xenoblade series is, like, those massive yeah. zones with the giant enemies <laughs> walking around. I mean... I hope we get that once, like we're past like the calm stuff. Like, we, like I want to see one of those giant snakes just like out in the open. Like, heck mm-hmm. yes, that feels so good to see that, and so intimidating. Because I, I think I think a lot of us can agree we don't want a Final Fantasy 15 again. No, the no, I don't want the it. issue with Final Fantasy 15. I I really enjoyed 15, but you spend so much of that time driving that it's crazy. You know, like the the hunts are like the most fun part of the game's gameplay, in my opinion, when you're going to look for monsters and stuff. But Dude, like the world's just big for the sake of being big. Yep, exactly. And when you're when when you're driving, like what is in between your driving? Like the the reason people have contention with FF15, even if you did have like a, a, a game like FF7 that had a lot of towns and stuff like that, 15 didn't have towns. It had two. <laughs> it literally had like the yeah. one on the cliff and then the really big one that's like a story town, and everything else was gas stations and Denny's. So like that that's what you had to look forward to it's like oh we're making a pit stop it was like driving through fucking arizona like it was the whole game was like that you're eventually just going to run into a gas station and a denny's and then you stop and then you just keep going type shit and then there's like you know a beach town which is practically a dock so <laughs> that that's the problem with 15 is that there's really not a lot of like big stuff that happens in between your yeah. journey 7 is not that 7 is like medium sized town small sized town 
Junion Harbor. You know, big place. Lots of shit happens here. Cross the damn ocean. Costa mm -hmm. del Sol. Small town. Eventually get to, uh, not Medeal. It is um, Barrettstown. Corel and yeah. Mount Corel. Mm -hmm. Dungeness area. Dungeon mountain area that leads to the Golden Saucer. Big town. Because now that I start, like, thinking about it, there's about, like, five or six, maybe five, like, actual really big locations in FF7 on the way to... Uh, on the way to the Forgotten City. And then everything is yeah. kind of like medium to smaller size. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like, Gold Saucer's a fucking huge that's, amusement that's the, park. It's that's like, like the biggest one. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. I did ask earlier, I know it kick-started uh, your, 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 some of your theories there, Max, but to bring it back, like, again, I'll re-ask it, Gold Saucer, are you expecting it oh, to, yeah. like, have mini-games and stuff, like, a lot of, like, that, or do you have any different expectations for gold saucer because it's one of the highlights and one of the more memorable parts i mean the the, the dating sequence and uh all the, the chocobo racing like we're getting chocobo <laughs> racing you think we're getting that i i here here's my answer to that if i go into the golden saucer in in the remake and if i go into the arcade and i don't see a mog machine that oh. has me playing a barely interactive mog dating sim <laughs> where eventually you get with the female mog and make a bunch of tiny mogs to get the GP that you need to spend on the rest of the, the, the arcade games. The, it's essentially the starter thing. If the mog mating minigame is not in Final Fantasy VII Remake Part Two, hashtag not my Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I can tell you. Yeah, I think there's going to be minigames. I mean, I can tell you what's going to be guaranteed to be there is the Battle Arena. Oh, yeah. That's 100% going to be in this game because they had the Battle Arena mm -hmm. in Remake Part 1 under a uh, Wall Market. They're going to have that Battle Arena. In oh, there. heck yeah. I don't know if you'll get Ami Slash maybe quite yet, but they're going to have that. 100%. Yeah. And it'll be different than the Battle Arena from, you know, uh, the Don Corneo's Battle Arena. You know, mm -hmm. that, and I think that was just like a setting up for this thing that it's like, mm -hmm. oh, here's the here's the bigger one that's run by, not Dine. What's his it's name? Like D is Dio. It Dio. It's Dio. Yeah, yeah. And he's yeah. gonna be wearing a speedo. He has to. Oh if, yes. If Dio's not a giant buff dude wearing a speedo, hashtag <laughs> yeah, not my up. Final <laughs> Fantasy Seven. Yep. You know, I, I hope, think. Uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, I hope the haunted house mansion is still mm -hmm. in this game. Mm -hmm. I think I all has so that much shit. personality. Yeah, it's, all they that shit's gonna be like, there. They didn't really skimp on anything in part one. They from didn't. What I can recall. So it's like, heck yeah, expect a lot. They, I mean, to be to be completely honest, they turned Wall Market into like ten times more than it was they, in the yeah. original. They did, and that they was sure the did. big. That was outside of the Shinra headquarters, right? That was the big place of of uh, the original Final Fantasy VII that you actually hung out in for more than like a few seconds. Mm -hmm. So. Will they be doing that to the place you technically spend the most time in the entire in the entire original game? Yeah, I think they're going to give you a shit ton of stuff to do in mm -hmm. in remake part two in the Golden Saucer, yeah. and I think everyone's going to be singing the music at the end. It's yeah. just going to be the same ad nauseum theme that'll be in everybody's head, just like it was twenty five years ago. Heck yeah, yeah. Damiani, one more thing they'll have oh. is the date, a hundred percent, but this time, well. You could you'll be able to do Barrett again, Tifa and Aerith, of course, but also this time you'll be able to do Jesse. Oh, they really want to wow. keep teasing oh, that. Okay, wow. going. I <laughs> yeah, I would. I think I think if you want to properly expand it, I think you should be able to go on a date with every single character in the party. And there's that would like be great. there's like moments where you have to choose like to bring Red Thirteen or oh. to talk to Barrett, <laughs> or and, mm -hmm. and they all add points just like the the moment in uh, remake part one where it can either be Barrett, Tifa, or Aerith that mm -hmm. reveals some big story thing, and Aerith is obviously the most important for the story. But everyone else is there. Yeah, yeah dude, I think I think you could you could go on a date with the dog <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. they just use the template that they did for. Part, uh, for for remake because of that certain things you did determine whether who you got mm -hmm. in the cutscene and, and then that part so this is gonna be that was definitely gonna be more involved in this one and you're, I think you're right Max I think it'll be like anyone who's a possible option will be possible yeah. to get and there'll be a trophy get everybody on the date <laughs> multiple yes yeah. yeah in the same way yeah. that was get all the dresses yeah, yeah. yeah. it's absolutely yeah. gonna be that and why, like, why why do we think they would do that a lot of people are like they're not gonna be able to fit that much stuff in the game. I think they're hyper aware of players' expectations. 
you know mm -hmm. I, I think yeah. they, including what we went through with part one the ending of part one and how it deviated so hard really set people off where like the ending of some things will really sour the entire experience for a lot of people and they, they don't understand what the ending of part one means so it can really dour like the rest of the game for you to like no, dude, like 99% of that game was insanely faithful, <laughs> like almost mm -hmm. like word to word, like expanded so much on what the original was and is like better in many ways than the original Midgar. So why assume that they're just going to throw all that out? Like the end of part one was there so that they don't have to, they can literally set up for more stuff to happen. They can literally give themselves a little bit more freedom with how they're going to tell this story. And you actually kill the time ghosts. You know, they're dead. So everyone being worried that, oh, no, they're they're going to do the same thing. Like, no, they're dead. Like, that was the whole point. They're supposed to be annoying and you kill them. I mean, I still don't agree with it completely. Right. I wish they did handle it differently. But it does set up for a part two to be a situation that is going to be way better than part one, in my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a pretty important question because it, it's about the progression in this game. And if they're going to carry any over, and I'm pretty sure both of you already know the most elegant way to probably solve this. Um, how are they going to handle carrying over your progress, especially materia? And tell me how it's going to be the Yuffie scene and how she's going to take all your materia. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be the Yuffie scene <laughs> real early. Have Have you guys played um, or have seen uh, Final Fantasy VII? Uh, oh God, what's the, I forget what the fan, new threat. The fan. Have you ever I've seen it? Thing? I haven't yeah. played it. Yes. Okay. So if if you get a chance to play it, I'm just going to tell you guys, you'll fucking. Love it. If you love Final Fantasy VII, you will fucking love it. It's fantastic. It's, it's just an expansion. It adds more mechanics. Oh, it makes materia combinations like way smarter. Like they mm. actually have impacts on stuff. And it also changes a lot of story stuff. And one of those story things is that that just makes sense in a really smart way. And a lot more side quests, which are genuinely thought through. One thing that they do in there is that there's a scene after Cloud tells his story. And once it's all done, Yuffie isn't a side quest where you have to go to a uh, a forest to find her. No, she gets in while well, everyone is sleeping that night after calm for the morning. She gets in and sneaks in like a ninja and steals everything. Heck yeah, and that's Makes actually sense. part of the story. And then you run into her when you're on your way. Our materia has gone. Your whole party is like, what the heck happened? Like, and you're sort of questioning it and the party leaves and you run into her uh, on the way out there and you literally have to like fight her to get your materia back. So I think they'll do something extremely similar, except you won't get your materia back. Yeah, they're definitely going to have to take away your power. Like, I don't think you're going to be level 50 or 60 or whatever at the start of this game. You're going to no. start fresh, pretty much. Yeah, I don't think they're going to dot hack the game. No. Where your no. save file continues right over. No, no, I think it's, it's a different game. There might be mm -hmm. like a completion bonus of some kind, you know, for doing mm -hmm. something from the pre if you have save data. But if, if we're talking about actual progression, like, no, this is a different game. Just like Final Fantasy X-2, just like Thirteen Part Two, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense. I definitely agree with that. Another thing I'm excited to see um, and hope it comes to pass is uh, I think Red Thirteen is going to be playable. Player-controlled character. <laughs> yeah, I think he will. I think everyone, every main party member will be playable, at least, in some way. I don't think they're going to make any character you have not playable. Yeah. I mean, that's... Uh, that's my question to you guys is how do you think Damiani how do you think they're actually going to expand the playability slash battle system now that you have way more characters yeah that's been a question because of the I don't think they're going to expand from beyond three players I do think no. I mean Max I think we might have talked about this or I might talk to Brad I'm forgetting who I've talked about because I talk about this so much uh, like in, in your in your background in fighting games back assist system where you call out other players that are just in your party because what are they they're just hanging out back there it's like oh well yeah. <clears throat> they are now each character can have like a partner with them and they have when you switch to them if they have enough like ATB they can like no summon in this person and maybe do a combo attack with them which combo yeah. things could be a thing that they open up a little bit more by like because sorry this is going from what I saw in the Xenoblade 3 presentation yesterday but there's a thing about like combining characters powers for like a fusion thing I was like dude that would be really sick if like someone does like this material attack and I do it and at the same time and it causes like a combined effect on an enemy yeah. or there's combo type attacks is like you're gonna have a lot of party members I think that's the best way to handle it is uh, just by having mm -hmm some kind of like assist or call in system um and yeah we technically got that in in yuffie's dlc it, it, yeah exactly yeah it's yeah. practically there dual text yeah dual text triple text 
throw them in. Yeah. How, how do you, how do you feel, Brad? Do you, how, how, how expansive do you think that's going to get? Do you think like dual text, triple text is kind of where they're going? Yeah, I think so. There's a lot of party members and a lot of like possible combinations. I wonder if they'll handle it like Chrono Trigger where like to do a specific move, you need this specific party member combination or something yeah. like that. I could see them doing like a few because it could get really dicey if you have every party member and like that's a lot of moves and they're sure. all individual moves i think maybe you'll get like one or two maybe but then i do definitely think the assist thing of your party members coming in because like they want that feeling of these characters all being together a team. they don't want you to feel yeah a team they don't want you to feel like team a team b kind of thing like that like yeah they may not be out there the whole time but their presence is there with yeah. you on the battlefield you want to you want barrett to fastball special tifa and yeah. she like dolphin kicks the shit out of something like yeah. that that should happen mm -hmm. um yeah i feel like once again I, I think a lot of stuff that happens in yuffie's dlc is sort of telling for where they're going to go sonon wasn't playable obviously but he was doing stuff that you there's no reason why he couldn't be playable with all the dual tech things and stuff like that it's mm -hmm. like they were focusing on really yuffie's combat is like the best example of where they want to go with this oh yeah we fixed the air combat we fixed a lot of this other stuff it feels a lot better now you know mm -hmm. like there's already big improvements even within one year of the original release so i yeah i think they're definitely going to do team up attacks that that's that's absolutely going to be there but i feel like they're going to push it even further and they could save this for part three, but I don't think they're going to because there's already a big part two once you leave Midgar story element that brings the party together. And that's the fact that you have a cell phone. Mm -hmm. uh, you get the PHS in, in part two when you leave. So to me, like active PHS during battle makes a lot of sense where you can you're always going to have three characters on screen. But to me, like you Final Fantasy 10 that shit. OK, and you yeah, can just depending on ATB pop in the other dude. Just yeah. bring in red thir mm. red 13 replaces tifa go crazy you know and now and now you have a completely you have a battle system that is structurally the similar as before three characters doing things but now you can rotate in other characters when their atb is ready and it's like oh sist okay kind of thing red 13's ready to go snap him in like do do some crazy stuff and then you just re mm -hmm. reattune all the monsters to deal with like yeah. five to six to seven of a party member at any given time yeah i think that's so a that's good way. like yeah, and that that makes it that makes it not feel like like all right, sitting at the out, outside of Midgar, Aerith, Tifa, and Cloud. Let's go! Like picking all the girls, huh? Really? We're not even. See you later. Like that whole like weird <laughs> part of the game where it's like everyone, like Cloud just picks his put the people that he likes the most, and everyone just pieces out and goes sits in an inn. No, nah, like they they have to fix that issue. That's like a problem. Everyone needs to be in this together, so they have to fight together in some way. So I think. I think it's a way to, 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 to create mm -hmm. a solution to that issue of the original FF7. Yeah, I wonder if they'll even go a step further and put like more potential on-screen prompts, like if you fulfill conditions to like call out players for like those mm -hmm. special combo, yeah. like you did the dual text and stuff, or it's like, oh yeah, yeah, like just to make it feel like a, even more action heavy without going too far with, so it still feels like the system that they're doing right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they'll, they'll they'll change anything about like ATB like the slowdown stuff like it looks spectacular and stuff but I wonder if they're gonna make any refinements in that or they're gonna leave it at like it's gonna look just the same do you think they, they change anything about that or leave it alone I think it will be changed I think a lot of the foundation is already there you know like a lot of what they they're not gonna completely change the battle system at all in fact, like figuring out that battle system probably took them years a long time <laughs> yeah. to even figure out how to get that shit online and actually functioning the way it does. So they're not going to get rid of that. Oh, but what they can do is like expand it and yeah, mm, getting yeah. getting rid of some of the moments that really took time off the clock type of stuff could be important. What about summons? I mean, they looked cool and they were awesome, but like, do you think they're going to I feel like it's the system they might do the most changes to potentially. Um, mm. do, do, you, do you have any idea, either of you have any ideas about what you want to see change about summons or did you like how they were uh, keep them as is summons are a tricky thing it depends how like powerful they want these summons to feel to me in remake they felt pretty powerful because it's a rare occasion and they could really mess some stuff up but yeah I don't know if they're gonna make it you could just pop a summon every fight because that kind of almost takes away their power sure to an extent I think and makes them feel less special but Damian, the only reason that makes me think they could be incorporated more is because of what we're hearing from 16 and how incorporated they sound. I wonder if they're like, you know, they're like, okay, well, we can make these summons more part of the combat some way. Yeah. I don't want them 
all the time. I don't want to be able to call them anytime I want kind of thing, but maybe a little more frequent, sure. Yeah, and, and part one, like, you bring up a great point about, like, it's a Final Fantasy game. Of course there has to be summons, you mm -hmm. know? Even though what is in the original FF7 in Midgar, no summons, yeah. you know? No, yeah. The, the summons in part one really felt like, well, we can't release a Final Fantasy VII remake, even though there's no summons. We can't release a game with no summons. Like mm. that's what people. That's like a staple of the series. So, th to me, Part One feel like they shoehorn them in. You know, they randomly show up. They they mm -hmm. are very powerful. You fight them in VR like type of stuff. It felt like they were, they had to like sort of like stretch their imaginations of like, so how do we actually make this work with this with this part of the game, you know? And it definitely comes across as like, okay, you're pushing the limits a little bit. Like I found, I think I remember finding Chocomog in like a giant air fan vent, yeah. just sitting there. <laughs> it's like, oh, some okay. Dumpster. They're just like yeah. sprinkled throughout random places. Like they just given to you by some people for like, wow, that's very powerful. This is insane. Mm -hmm. Like they're not, they're not really handled with a ton of care, I would say in part one. But in part two, that's different. Like, you, you're probably going to get Chocomog or something like that when you immediately go to the Chocobo farm. It'll be a different one. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I, think, I think the way summons are presented to the player will be more naturally integrated into the environment and the world. That'll make a lot more sense. Gameplay-wise, I don't know how they're going to handle it, because if they're super powerful, then the random thing might not be worth it, you know? But it depends how you recover MP. It depends mm -hmm. what resources they use. Like, how... And if, if they... They could make it, like... FF7 OG, where they're just super expensive, you know? Like, Chocomog didn't cost a lot, but eventually, like, you only can summon Bahamut so much, dude, because, geez, you better have a lot of tents ready to go, or else this is yeah. just gonna, you know... I, and I feel like, yeah, you're, what you're saying is absolutely right. Fitting them into an action combat setting is difficult. So I don't know what yeah. their answer is going to be, but I think they'll make... They'll feel a lot more natural in Part 2 than they were in Part 1. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. They were like on a meet. I'm trying to remember. Were they on like a meter in part one, or you just you take a lot of damage and you be able to some of them? I felt like they were random, man. I can't even. I don't okay. even remember. Like they just showed yeah. up sometimes. Maybe just something where it feels more like predictable and you can kind of control the outcome more. I guess. Yeah, because but what? just making them rare still, but like yeah, you could kind of build toward towards it easier. Because they didn't didn't they follow a kind of similar pattern or like choice of how they like show up in like FF15 where it's like this is a power yeah. of the god type thing they show up not exactly when you need them but sometimes when they should you know like mm -hmm. that kind of thing is when they would show up I, I don't yeah, know so sorry. Can't remember. Yeah. to double check for for seven remake because yeah it did, I was trying to remember I can't remember so summons cannot be used at will it requires special conditions to be activated one of them requires characters to sustain damage during battle um, during boss go. battles, summons can be used once the boss takes a specific amount of damage. If either condition is met, green energy will manifest in the air high above the characters, and a summon gauge appears. And then the timer, yeah. And this is mm. why Carbuncle was broken. <laughs> because uh, the, the DLC, I think Carbuncle was the DLC. Remember, mm -hmm. remember that one? You would get low on health or something, and it would essentially like full revive absolutely everybody, or, or it was yeah. one of those summons that did that, and it was just like, wow, okay, it's just a complete revival? Jesus, mm -hmm. it's like a second chance summon for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, that's like replacing Phoenix, like... They practically did. Yeah, can't do that. Yeah. Do that. Um, Maxi dotted the journey um, to uh, Temple of the Ancients. But he did skip a landmark, and I know they have re they reworked it in Intergrade, so we saw maybe a hint of what they're doing with it. But the physical location, oh. Fort Condor, Fort Condor, um, yeah, obviously we we expect the minigame to return, and do you expect the physical place to actually be in the game and gonna go visit it? I, and here this is this is my general answer to everything in part two. If you ask the question. Do you expect place from the OG game to show up in part two? My immediate answer is absolutely. Like, because mm -hmm. the devs know that. The devs 100% know that if it's not there, people will be pissed. If the if Dio's not wearing a bikini, people will be pissed, you know? Like, so mm -hmm. I think it'll be there. I think the way, I think it'll be integrated into the story a lot more, where it'll be like, oh yeah, this is where all, this is where that Fort Condor game comes from. And yeah. you see like a bunch of Shinra soldiers like running across the road or something and you hide from them and you see them running towards Fort Condor. You're like, what's going on? We should help them. Like, no, we got to go do our thing. No, we should help them like type of thing. That, that'll probably freaking happen. Yeah, I 
I could kind of see it being like almost a tourist kind of place since <laughs> that's where the game originated from. Yeah. I would love if if they include Fort Condor tournament arc at oh, Fort Condor. Yeah. Heck yeah. Playing Shinra people in Fort Condor or something. Like, I think you should totally have still, like, the actual Shinra soldiers invading it kind of thing. Oh, but, like, yeah. yeah. Go, you could goof it up. If you if you don't do Fort Condor at Gold Saucer, which also makes complete sense. Oh, yeah. I hope it, the game is tied into that location, though, some way. Yeah, I, that makes a lot of sense. Like, why would they include Fort Condor? The, like almost like a one-to-one -one recreation, but better of the old RTS thing that you did in mm -hmm. OG Seven. Why would they essentially remake that in Integrade when you could save that for the next game? Because it mm -hmm. isn't very, very very much like Square just to be like, oh, we're just going to take the exact same mini game beep, and put it over here too. You're like, oh, I already did this. You know, maybe mm -hmm. maybe they will. It more makes me think that they're going to like have an action RTS mini game, like at, with your actual party. Where yeah, you I coordinate, could see that, yeah. you know, where like maybe you get into like you coordinate the the structure of how enemies go in certain directions and your your own like you know resource and units, but then you actually fight when you get there, like that mm -hmm. would make a lot of sense to me. Where you really yeah. expand on that shit. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that was what was coming to my mind first. Max is that maybe they how they solve it is they just make your party members do like that type of RTS battle and that yeah. would make more sense for it to be like a physical location where that was like actually under attack because otherwise, yeah, yeah I think they got to play with expectations and just have fun with it. Like a tournament arc would be sick. Like maybe like every so often, like there's a tournament there or just the tournament because I mean the original game, you had to progress far enough for the events at the Fort Condor to advance. So you could go back there yeah. and keep doing the next stage of it. But I don't think they're going to probably the other do that again. That's the other challenge of like how far do you take Fort Condor in yeah. part two? Because you don't have an airship to get back there to progress world events to see things change. Mm -hmm. You know, like you essentially have to take the boat back across the Atlantic Ocean of Final Fantasy VII. Right? So I'm, oh, I'm kind of curious like what they're going to do. I, I think I know. Oh. So the minigame will be back. There'll be NPCs you challenge. Yeah. And that's the that's that's how you qualify for the tournament at Fort Condor. So it will just be a single tournament at Fort Condor, like the big championship. And it happens at any point in the game once you qualify. But like if you go too mm. far, like you, you only get like one chance against an NPC. And if like I'm, I don't know if they'll give you one chance, but you got to beat certain NPCs because the system already exists in 14 with Triple Triad that they have yeah. like story NPCs that you can challenge to to be the, to beat them. And then like you qualify, go to the tournament, and then yeah, you win or lose there, and that's it. It's kind of like the Blitzball tournament in 10. There's, I mean, yeah, you can play Blitzball later through the Sphere Grid, but like that one tournament beginning, that's it. You just do that yeah. as a story beat, and then you move on from it. Yeah, this is like your, your triple triad turtle turtle dudes that are in Integrate and stuff mm -hmm. like that, like mm -hmm. random NPCs that are looking for, for games or matches or stuff, and you can you can make it fit in that way. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. And it's just completely be, yeah. optional. Yeah, um, I think you could completely miss it if you don't want to do it. Like, it's just a skippable yeah. thing. Yeah. But you know what, you want that trophy. Yeah, I think it'd be cool to treat it like Gwent. I don't know if you guys played Witcher 3, but like oh, Gwent, Gwent in that. Is, yeah. And there's like yeah. tournaments and stuff like that, story stuff. So yeah. But like making Fort Condor optional is like, I don't know if they're going to make anything optional. I think I think everything's going to be kind of mandatory. Yeah, I, and like, the same. Like Wutai. Exactly. Everything. Exactly. Like I think all this stuff like Vincent, you know, is optional. Yeah. <laughs> I think all the things that were essentially optional in the original are now going to be story and there will be additional side side quest stuff that will be the new optional, right? Because they mm -hmm. they already did that in remake part one. <laughs> yeah. All this stuff that was essentially like kind of optional in part one uh, or in the OG was essentially integrated into story now and there wasn't much but then they added a bunch of crazy other stuff like deep ground and shit like that that also became some optional stuff for if you want to go fight some super mega behemoth you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe you could watch the loveless play in it'll tie into <sighs> Genesis maybe. that's a theory it could happen <laughs> that's a, that is a theory <laughs> man um one thing that we saw in remake was that pretty beautiful CG cutscene of the uh, getting kind of like the history of like the Setra, the ancients, and mm -hmm. their civilization. And like we never saw anything like that before. Like no, that, that no. and I, I think they wouldn't have done. Like, do you think it ends there? Because my gut is there's more to this. Like, I think the ancients and Setra might play like a pretty big role, and that to point that like you know 
we might see them more than just Aerith somehow? Or do you yeah, think like the ancient yeah. Cetras versus Genova like is gonna come into play a little bit more prominently somehow? You know you know where this comes into play? Uh part three. Mm -hmm. all, all the materia and stuff, all the crazy, all the ancient caves that the Cetra, like, the, the materia combinations and all that stuff, mm -hmm. like Knights of the Round, like, how the hell does Knights of the Round make sense in the original FF7? It makes zero sense. You know, right. you're essentially summoning all these, like, creatures and ancient myth myth mythical creatures, and then all these dudes in techno, like, King Arthur and the Knights of Justice show up to whoop ass, and like, okay, this was just somebody's crazy idea, and they just threw it in the game. But how do you make that actually make sense? Like, Oh no, the Cetra summoned these, like, 15 lofty knights to save them, you know, from ancient times type shit to, to fight against Genova. And you have to go discover that power, and potentially when you, when you touch the materia or something, what if you get, like, a vision of it? You can't communicate with them, obviously, like Aerith can, but maybe, like, you get glimpses of, like, what this was used for. Like, this crazy quadra magic, like, type of shit, you know? Like, that's, to me, that, that's part three stuff, and it's a really a, a revisiting of, like, what the Cetra was and, like, discovering how much power they had and how connected they were with the planet. Okay. Damn, that'd be yeah. sick, giving context that's why part to all three, that more. That's why part three sounds fucking amazing to me if they if they go yeah. that direction. that That's how you really expand part three if part two goes all the way to Northern Crater. Yeah, like, that makes me wonder if they'll expand upon, like, Genova more as a being, actually. Like, seeing Genova, like, when it, like, whatever crash lands on the planet, you know, this fucking weird eldritch... Yeah, whole horror healing thing, kind of yeah. thing, yeah, and just kind of diving into more of that because Genova's like pretty damn mysterious throughout the original. And they game. should keep it that way, and and I, I don't think they should explain everything about Genova, right. but I think there should definitely be like expansions because they've already we already saw that cutscene. We saw what the Cetra mm -hmm. actually looked like, for God's sake. Yeah. We saw their weird like fantasy Final Fantasy fourteen looking world that they lived in type of thing. <laughs> so I mean, I think I think smaller expansions on that and and leaving the mystery intact where it's like oh no we have to go throughout the planet and find their power because it's still around and Bugenhagen will probably understand that yeah he's gonna be the up. one when Aerith is gonna mention it in part two and she'll probably say that like before she gets axed or something like that she'll mention it so it, it makes a lot of sense that part three might be pretty sick and the most connected to the planet of everything I keep kind of kind of selling me on this part three being <laughs> like yeah you kind of sell me on this idea yeah i'm looking forward to what the the weapon fights will be like because those things gotta be like oh. something special because yeah they're already doing yeah like how are you gonna do underwater yeah like fight? emerald it's like yeah. whoa okay I, how you plan to tackle that one but i can't how, wait to see how do you even how do you even battle something that's like 200 feet tall yeah well, like, torso battle. We, even, <laughs> like, do we just do we just hack at its foot and then and then it falls on its knee and then you climb up its knee and you hack at its nuts and then you just yeah, keep going dude. higher and higher and higher? Isn't that what the Dragon's Dogma video just talked about, like making giant yeah. enemies and like you always just hack at their yeah, yeah, feet? Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, granted, yeah. the uh, there there is people that are working at Square right now that are literally ex Dragon's Dogma battle designers. So I'm yeah, just you could throw that you out could there. transition. You know, start the feet some cutscene transition like I think what diamond weapon you fight on the airship or something like that like uh diamond weapons like right outside Midgar like on the floor yeah. okay, <laughs> like, I'm trying to I think you fight which one do you fight in ultimate. the air ultimate yeah. that's all, all ultimate weapon yeah ultimate yeah okay weapon. you could do some shit like that like something transitioning <laughs> maybe not for all of them but like moving up it I think they there's there's already like a visual primer of how you can make this fight work and it's from Advent Children. Because they <laughs> Boosting have, everyone up? Yeah, like, not, not, not just yeah, that, yeah. but, like, how, how do you fight this thing in Advent Children? How do we make that actually work in, in a game? Mm -hmm. And that's, like, a big challenging gameplay thing that designers kind of love sometimes, if not hate, where it's like, so how do, we make, how do we make an actual giant kaiju fight interesting? Like, how do we fight this with your party? Uh, and the answer is a Gatling gun. The answer yeah. is, like, you just, you just get on a turret. And there's a big turret sequence, and everyone gets on turrets, and we feel like we're in the Xbox 360 era again, and we're playing Gears, and you just turret. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you just, oh, I swear to God, if it's that, I'll be pissed. No. They could do different party members doing different things. Yeah. Fight, like a different phase. Yeah. When I think of, like, the end of the original game, when you're fighting, like, Sephiroth, you know, you got, like, two groups or three groups, whatever, fighting at the same time. Yeah. 
it could have, you know, It'd be kind of sick like, on a mini gun. It actually be a cool concept to else. do it all in real time. So it's not like you do one phase and move on to the other. It's like you got to juggle like all your party members split into like three groups potentially. And oh, like they like you realize, oh, you need to attack this part. So then we unlocks like a barrier on this, so we can do damage to this in this window. Like it, mm. it, it's yeah. almost like raid mechanic at that point, where it's like, holy crap, this could get pretty elaborate fast. I think that's the big challenge of part three. Actually, is designing is is essentially the decision of how does that look, how does that play, how do you integrate your whole party, how do you eventually engage with this creature in in several ways, and how do you make it different for every single weapon? Because every weapon yeah, is different. Yeah, that's a yeah. big. So that task. that seems like okay. So, so that's that's immediately what makes part three way different than part two, right? Because part two is just a globe trotting adventure. The big difference in part two from part one open world you know or not open world but like big environments where we're scouring the world coming across new places we essentially feel like we choose where to go even though you don't and you you essentially make the progress right but part three is like oh the world's your disposal you have an airship so what's what's now the big crazy gimmick of of this game do you fly around like on an air oh there you go that's how you engage the fight you like fly around with the airship with like guns and stuff like that and like you actually pilot the airship and then everyone parachutes off or something like I could just mm -hmm. that, th imagine how much fun that'll be like imagine the visual spectacle yeah. of like an aerial shot through the clouds of the uh, diamond weapon trying to like knock you down or, like okay this will sell some copies of the game right here yeah where we landed boys on the shoulder <laughs> <laughs> on yeah. the shoulder <laughs> let's go um yeah, that sounds pretty. That, that sounds very awesome. My my, I was gonna say a wacky thing and say, I wouldn't be surprised if one of those battles you were in some kind of like mech outfits or mech device fighting one of them would be like yeah, just, sure, would be sick. Some Shinra, yeah, some Shinra weapon weapons or, yeah. just to counter them. Like just one of them, not all of them. This is one would be kind of cool if it came like you're in a bunch of mini mechs trying to fight like the bigger mech. Like, hey, it'd be hype. We. We did just see Scarlet in practically a Final yep. Fantasy VI esque like Shinra mech weapon sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know, man. There's already there's already some pieces in place here. Yeah, um, Max. Um, I wanted to know if there was anything we really haven't talked about that uh, you felt like needs to be said about like Rebirth that uh, we didn't really cover, um, or if you feel like we've uh, we've covered some good ground here because I know sometimes you always have something that. Just doesn't seem to, to come out from our questions that you're just burning to talk about. I think the only thing is that I uh, uh, about the the names of the games, and I I think they're they're really trying to make this a story about Sephiroth, right? Where re remake is referring to Sephiroth's intentions in part one. I'm going to remake what happened before and remake the timeline in 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 a way where he practically lets the party destroy fate. So that's part of his plan. I think rebirth. If the game goes as far as I think it does, which is eventually delivering the Black Materia to Sephiroth, that is Sephiroth's rebirth. He died, right? Mm -hmm. The Sephiroth that you see in several different occasions in part one, if not every single time in the original that leads you to the Northern Crater, are essentially manifestations of him. They're not actually him. They're like genova celled versions of him, if not clones, that are making their way up there. So his rebirth is when he gets the Black Materia, right? So I think... That's referring to Sephiroth, in my opinion, if it goes that far, and that's like the end of the game type thing you learn that, in the same way that Remake is the end of the game type thing you learn there. So the question is, like, the, the title of the third one, I think, is going to be extremely relevant to, like, Sephiroth and his intentions. Because I don't know if you remembered in the trailer, there is a big-ass splash text that pops up on the screen at some point that is like, what is Sephiroth's end game and then cloud <laughs> tells you he's trying to you know he's trying to take over the planet with genova at his side but that's cloud's uneducated ass that's talking about that that's essentially his like his interpretation of what sephiroth's intentions are the old version of sephiroth so now i think like oh what is his actual end game is going to be the big like, okay, so what is his intention by doing all this? What does he actually want the players to do? And that's going to go back to the seven seconds thing. That's going to go back to Ugh. all the crazy teases and shit that he's, like, fucking with Cloud. It's like, okay. 
and that's what part three part three is naming convention and the reason why it's like i can't wait like the is like i can't wait to share with you what part three is called <laughs> like and i'm like <laughs> you crazy bastard all right i'm on board what is that yeah. going on so that's that's where i actually feel that th this re stuff at the beginning of this uh, the subtitles of every single game is actually referring to sephiroth and his intentions and what that last one will be, I don't even know. If it's not Reunion, because it's not going to be Crisis Core thing again, you know, I don't know. It's going to have to be something interesting. Revengeance. Yeah, yeah. Revengeance. <laughs> Reanimated. I don't know, dude. Resurrections. <laughs> yeah. Geez. Yeah, I think it's going to be... Uh, I mean, yeah, I think you're spot on with that. Um, I just... I, I, I totally believe that we're going to hit all the beats and stuff, but I, I, I do feel like part three will fulfill that but i think it's going to go beyond that i think there's so much of that game like at least half to a third of that game is going to be beyond what we've even seen like in the original mm. game because i think that's yeah. what this end game is I, I feel like it has it's leading to something more than just all right no matter what happened we there is a final confrontation of sephiroth and it's just over like one way or the another like i i, I think there's gonna be more to that and i will be slightly disappointed i mean i'm also dreading how the hell they're gonna like one up these Sephiroth battles, I'm like, okay, like, how, like, how, like, we just did an Advent Children self fight with them for the end of one. It's like, yeah. what are you gonna, I, I know what it's gonna look like probably, but it's like, how? Like, are you gonna oh, dazzle um, me by making my PS5 like shake to its core with like Supernova yeah. or something? Like, you hear that fan <laughs> yeah, kicking it in so real? hard. That's how you know it's happening. There's no tell except oh, you're, that's the only tell for I defending it. against it is your fan. I got it. So, so how you top that is, you play as Zack, and you fight Cloud as the final boss, who's under the control of Sephiroth, and you have to snap him out of it. Or oh, whatever. the Zack timeline! Oh uh, shit! Yeah. Because Cloud will be different in that time. Oh, oh shit! What if Cloud dies in Zack's timeline? Yeah, and Zack no. has to. Oh, Brad just figured it out gonna have to fight they, Cloud. They flip it, where like all the crazy trauma that happens to Cloud because Zack died is flipped in, in Zack's timeline. Where punish Zack. Potentially punish Zack is what happens. And, and then why does that make part three even better when that eventually they get to part three? If Aerith is already mm -hmm. dead, right? In, in mm -hmm. Zack's timeline, which is presumed, right? Dead flowers at the end of the Yuffie DLC, that's presumed. So who is the important character that might get axed, right? If she's already gone. It could be the fact that Zack might have to actually kill his, like, best friend. Mm -hmm. And that would fuck him up and, and leave them on a very weird road for part three. And then what's the ultimate goal? Is that Aerith is now gone in both timelines. And since she's, like, in the planet, she can get the timelines together to get Cloud and Zack together. And you guys don't have to hate each other. Like, kick his ass. I'm like, oh, God, this would be the fucking coolest <laughs> thing in the world. <laughs> so I think I think stuff like that is where, like, yeah, maybe maybe the spoiling crisis core to build up this character's relationship with each other and why it's important and why Zach is important is worth it for this crazy mm -hmm. stuff to eventually happen. Because, like, the possibilities there seem like, oh, that's the coolest fucking thing ever. Like, that, that's so emotionally resonant for both characters. In part two, we, like, take both timelines and Empire Strikes Back, the Godfather to their asses, where everything is super sad. Everyone's in the worst they possibly can get to build up for this big epic, let's go kick his ass, part three. Like, I can't wait. That's right. <laughs> I can't that's wait. Right. <laughs> man, I'm so excited. This is oh, from day one, Max. This has been the hardest thing when they confirmed it was going to be multiple parts is that... I cannot stand waiting. I, I was like, I would I was like, part of me is like, I will wait 10 years for you to finish all of these and so I can play them all back to back to back. But no, you won't. Now it's no, like, yeah, nope. Nope, no, nope, you won't. nope, nope, nope. So if this you is the did, you would have missed out on all this, all this fun. Yeah, I know. It's like not knowing what the hell's going to happen. Yeah, but, um, yeah. That's, that's like my final question for you guys of all this conversation is uh, part two is coming out a lot sooner than people were expecting. And mm -hmm. that is mostly down to a few reasons. Uh, Nomura recently said that development is changed, that they recently changed their development structure, which I think is referring to the fact that they switched to Unreal Engine 5. I think, I think UE5, this might be one of the first really, really, really big UE5 games that uh, is probably helping development a lot because from what it seemed like from, from Unreal when they were making this engine is that they're trying to like not make it so that you can add even more detail to make some of that stuff easier to do, 
right? Because development time is taking too long. The engines need to change. In the, in the same way that like your engine of your car, you don't just keep sticking a bigger gas tank in the car to fit more gallons. No, you make the vehicle utilize less gas more efficiently. And that's kind of like the way everything's working now with even the video game industry. We have to make the things we do not take as long. And at a core fundamental level, the engine has to help out with that. So they keep saying that, oh yeah, it's going fast, it's going great. We're just, things are coming online quicker than ever before. I think that's probably in tandem with that. The fact that they switched development and they probably have switched engines and it's making things go quicker. So this one's coming out fast. And this game's probably way bigger, obviously, than part one. So how far do you think part three is from part two? My, mm, uh, my, my second question after. is, yeah. yeah, my second question is, does part two end like Back to the Future 2? Where it's like, here's a little bit of part three at the end of the trailer, at the end of the credits. I Maybe. I think they do. It's possible. Yeah. You know, they could definitely tease something. They kind of did that with uh, intermission, I guess, a little bit. You a know, bit. showing a little bit of where it's going to go. Yeah, I can see them teasing something. Like Kingdom Hearts games have been doing that since PS2 kind of thing. Yeah. I don't I, know about like, I think playing they, something. I don't. I don't think it'll be playing something. I think there. I think there could be because they will. They've already been saying that. Yeah, we have people that are already working on part three. You know. Yeah. Like the yeah, all these all these projects are developed like in tandem with each other. Things that were made in part one will help obviously with part three. So and the world is a big part of that from part two to part three. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I think we're gonna get a Back to the Future two moment where it's like the sequel isn't that far away. The, the final version isn't actually that far away. I think it'll be within like two years after part two. Shit. That, that's optimistic. That's optimistic. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. But if you think how much comes online with part two, once that's done, if it's if it's as big as we think it is. Mm hmm. I think there's a lot already done. I think while that's possible, I think because the importance of finishing the trilogy, like nailing that ending, it they might give themselves some more time just to really make sure everything is where they where they want it at. I, I mm. my so my guess is three years. I think it'll be three years after part two, part mm. three will be three years after part two. So if when beginning of twenty twenty four is when we get par, uh, rebirth, then part three would be like twenty twenty seven probably. Like sometime in twenty twenty seven would be my guess. So yeah, because. Uh, 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 the lead producer was Kitase was a little funny about that saying like within three years we're releasing a groundbreaking sequel to Final Fantasy 7 remake and it's like no yeah. <laughs> that, what you're saying means four years actually yeah. and like you're you're thinking like in fiscal I've, definition or something say like from that from intergrade though I think you said we just released like the intergrade this summer and from three yeah, years from that that's th what that's why I think I, because so. I did the same mistake too Max and I have rewatched when we were watching like he literally just said this past I was like oh okay because like three years from April of 2020 is not winter yeah. 2024 it's like he's referring to intergrade yeah mm -hmm. um that's also Which makes sense because yeah. that finishes that game's development yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we got another uh, in between game like a smaller like DLC thing. Um, focusing on something oh, else sure. between part two and part three. There's no way we don't. Yeah. In my opinion. There's, yeah. It's it's like, is Elden Ring going to get DLC? Yeah. Of course it is. It's, <laughs> absolutely, it's going to get DLC. Like, I think it'll it'll happen. I think it'll even happen for the final part as well. There'll be like another story or something like that 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 brings things even more finality in some way. And so, George Cerberus, uh, tiny yeah, in. <laughs> yeah, but, I'm sorry, you, what was your second question? I was like, had an answer and then I forgot what it was. Now I can't remember what to say. You said how oh, long after? Oh, just like how, how long after? Yeah, well, like how many other, years? You had something uh, else I forgot, maybe. Shit, I think, I think we answered it. Where it was like the, the following parts and how, uh, how much time they take in between. Yeah. I think that was it. All right, you yeah. know how, how long we're going to be waiting in between, you know, since we hit we're four years from part one to part two, and potentially you, my prediction like two to in year two to three years from part two to part three. Yeah, like I don't, I, I don't think it's going to be like twenty thirty, you know. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be that long. I don't think it's going to be that long either. Yeah. I hope I hope I don't eat those words <laughs> again. So. Yeah, I would I would like to think that yeah, the development of and all all how fast part two is coming online. Is, is directly going to help out how part three is going to get made because people don't really understand how a lot of like early game development works and the things that will take the longest is actually getting systems online 
like how do things function right how what does our game do like what do the characters mm. do like conceptualizing all that stuff and then getting it into states that is functioning uh is is the part that takes the longest because things will not work like figuring out that battle system took years and and eventually getting it online took years to the point where they're able to polish it now like less than a year later and integrate is like whoa yeah that's what that's when you have foundation it's way easier to expand upon it and like including graphics and visuals because integrate looked way better than the original did too funny enough in a lot of game development art is the thing that comes online the fastest once you know what's in the game and everyone has a foundation of what i should be working on bam 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 shit comes online super fucking quick man and that seems to be a lot of what part two is. A lot of part two is like, so do they have their world system figured out? Do they know what we're doing from part A to part B? Putting stuff in the world. Put stuff in there. We got to make no art assets mm -hmm. for this. If they have good producers and directors to get that stuff done, then yeah, they probably have a concise plan of just like, get this shit online. That's why we can release in 2024, you know? Nah. If they just have to make yeah. a ton of art, that's, that'll happen. That'll happen usually the quickest in a lot of game development. Well... Dang, I feel so excited, but that wait, always the wait, man, till, yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's like, even like the next time we say, like, I don't, like, how do you feel, like, to wrap this up here, do you, do you, do you, do you want to see more at this point, I know we are going to, but like, personally, are like, are you content, would you rather just like, skip ahead to winter 2024 and play it, or do you want, are you still excited to see more of what they have to I, reveal? I'm looking forward to the hype, okay. because... You know, we there's they, so much there, there's ever there's ever crisis and all those crazy remakes that they're putting out, you know, which even though we're on mobile are looking pretty interesting. There's also crisis core coming out at the end of this year, early next year, which will directly like tie in this stuff. We're going to have quite literally another conversation just like this at the beginning of 2023 <laughs> when the ending of crisis score like tries to tie in all this stuff and it's going to lead to all these conversations and things that's going to happen again. And then. What happens within, I'd say, if Crisis Core comes out like January, February of 2024, uh, like winter, you know, time frame, within four months after Crisis Core comes out, guess what we're getting? Most likely a state of play on 7 Remake Part 2. Because mm -hmm. that's when the state of play happened for Part 1. It was like right around May. And what's E3 is coming back next year. What is E3 next year going to be jam-packed with? Because potentially Final Fantasy 16 might be out by then. Square's booth at E3 is going to be FF7 Remake Part 2. Cute. So yeah, we're just heck, revisiting yeah, 2019 looking, all over again. Looking so forward to that. Man, it'd be insane if 16 wasn't out and they have both those games. Man, what a, what oh a, what a strong comeback year for like That's a E3. crazy E3. Oh, yeah. man. Like the Square Enix booth needs like an own hall at that point. Like just, <laughs> just, just put it in there. But... I, but I, then I, we yeah. get the wonderful, like the build up, you know, wait till Tokyo Good. Game Show next year, then there'll be another trailer, like all this stuff. <sighs> now you're getting, you no, know I'm remembering now because how cool is it going through like the, 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 the opening bombing run, like in person, like going through the briefing meeting when you sat there, yeah. like uh, that yeah. stuff was so fun. I want that. Again. So yeah, cool. I want that again. Yeah. That was and so then I, Make I, it. Gold saucer, man. He oh made my it. gosh, yeah. yes. Oh, there you shit. go. <laughs> you're I never leaving. <laughs> I'm betting that's what's going on. Yeah. Whew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're so right. I think there's a lot to look forward to, yeah. you know, and I think there's mm -hmm. and there's obviously like they, they even said this. Please enjoy all the other Final Fantasy seven things that we have working on until this comes out, because there's quite a few. There's a lot of things that are going to be coming out, including FF fucking 16 and Forspoken and Capcom's yeah, huge variety. Spoken. There's like there's so many games and things that are coming out in between this and and the the eventual like when we get more information on Rebirth, if not get to play Rebirth, that it's like. Okay, there's going to be plenty of stuff to, like, wet our whistle on the way there. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. I agree. Well, I think that, that that's good enough for now. As Max said, we'll probably be back at this in, <laughs> in, in, in once Crisis Core Reunion drops. Um, so you can look forward to that. But uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, Max, obviously, I feel like everyone should know who you are. But just in case some new person come here and just meeting you for the first time, where can uh, they, they check out more of your stuff and... Uh, uh, I saw I usually stream on Twitch under Maximilian underscore dude and um, uh, Yeah, I've been making YouTube videos on Final Fantasy 7 stuff ever since the announcement of remake uh, But I shockingly am a primary fighting game content creator So I play a lot of action games and especially fighting games and Street Fighter 6 seems pretty exciting to somebody like me So yeah, a lot of coverage of the like whenever there's new new stuff and theories and uh, information about FF7 remake part 2 uh, rebirth 
I'll definitely be covering it and looking forward to playing some of the classic games, including Crisis Core Reunion. Uh, there's new versions of FF7. I want to go through FF7 on PS1, you know, and play the actual OG version of the game, which would be great. So I'll be there'll be plenty of stuff leading up to uh, Rebirth. I have to give you guys a shout out. So for anybody that wants to, to stick tuned with Easy Allies and everything that goes on with like media coverage, please follow whatever platform this goes up on. I don't know if we're on Kazaa or Bearshare, but you definitely got to follow. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, big shout out to you guys. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Max. Yeah, anytime. Mm -hmm. And yeah, thanks, Brad, for, for, for being here, too. And uh, oh, yeah, man. Carrying a carrying the easy allies mantle with the ff7 remake there with the <laughs> and I, I personally my dream is i hope the two of you end up at e3 next or whatever it is next year in the same session or something together yeah. oh shit. maybe get yeah. to do the interview together please, <laughs> please dear god if we get yeah. like one of those dev moments yes. where they just they just sit in the back yes. and just show us yes. stuff like oh yes. god that's, oh. that's like my, my personal <laughs> hope so we'll uh we'll try to like Push Bloodworth a little bit, like, hey, uh, Bloodworth, kind of like pitch that to them as well. Like, hey, what, what, what's actually <laughs> yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. in? Oh, yeah. Make it happen. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for watching. And uh, yeah, this is not really like a spoiler mode, even though there are spoilers. So we'll hopefully we put a spoiler warning at the beginning of this. But yeah, um, we'll be back with more FF7 coverage uh, as it happens. But yeah, thank you to both. And uh, until next time, everyone, yeah, it's coming. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Get hype. <laughs> <laughs>